Hey there, welcome to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me Laura Adler, who is an environmental toxins expert and educator and a certified holistic health coach who teaches other health coaches, nutritionists, and other holistic health practitioners how to eliminate the number one thing holding their clients back from the results they're seeking, which is the unaddressed link between chemicals and chronic health problems. She trains practitioners to become experts in everyday toxic, toxic exposures so they can improve client outcomes without spending hundreds of hours researching on their own. Combining environmental health education and business consulting, she's helped thousands of health professionals in over 25 countries around the world elevate their skill set, get better results for their clients, and become sought-out leaders in the growing environmental health and detoxification field. She is also a member of the Naturopathic Association of Environmental Medicine and the American Holistic Health Association. So welcome, Laura. Such a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. So um, I want to start out this conversation with I and I I want to play let me start off by saying like I want to play devil's advocate a bit in this conversation. Yeah. Um I've personally found that I've had some really interesting from a psychological perspective uh discussions with other kind of respected health experts and friends of mine who also teach people whether they're in like the, the evidence-based fitness and nutrition space or more, you know, naturopathic doctors or more, you know, nutrition experts, I've had some really interesting discussions and I've found that this is an area where there's just, there's very often big gaps between the conclusions that people are drawing and yeah. the evidence. And specifically yes. within a lot of evidence-based circles, there is kind of this culture of, it's almost like a response to a lot of the pseudoscience that goes on in natural health circles where- yeah. You, you, you genuinely have some people in natural health circles who like just don't understand science. They're scientifically literate and they're like, the toxins, the toxins are everywhere. We need yeah. to detox and, yeah. you know, and, and who like just don't understand what they're talking about. And it's their buzzwords. It's buzzword communicating. Yeah. And who are fear mongering over toxins, but yes. are genuinely scientific, scientifically literate. So then you have kind of people in evidence-based circles who are, seeing that stuff and then they draw the conclusion well all of this talk of toxins is just nonsense and right. doesn't have any scientific support and we have you know the epa and the fda and they're studying these chemicals and they've established what a safe exposure limit right. is and we already have all the data and they're controlling all these things such that they would never allow any actually dangerous amount of toxic <laughs> yeah the food supply or the water supply or, you know, whatever, such that, you know, all this stuff is already known and it's taken care of. There's no real concern over that. That would be amazing if that was the case, <laughs> right? Like that would be, I would love that. That would be amazing if that was true. Yeah. Um, so, th so there's this big territory in the middle, right? Yes. Of, of like someone who actually has a nuanced and very deep understanding of the science around environmental toxicants or toxins as they're often yes. commonly referred to, yeah. uh, environmental chemicals and human health. And that's of course why I'm bringing you on. Yeah. So tell me kind of about that landscape, uh, you know, kind of the big picture understanding of what is the relevance of these environmental toxicants to human health. Right. So um, let, well, I'll even back up a little bit and talk about what you had just said, like, oh, the FDA and the EPA are protecting us and all this stuff has been studied. I think that's a gross misconception and also gross misunderstanding of our public policies relating to chemicals and the history of chemical regulation in this country. So the first primary piece of legislation that we had to regulate chemicals in the United States was the Toxic Substances Control Act passed in 1976. And at that time, there were already 62,000 chemicals that were registered for use. There were probably a lot more that just didn't make it onto the registration or the inventory. But during the past, after the passage of that uh, policy, all those 62,000 chemicals got a free pass and they were presumed safe. They never had any safety testing data. This includes things like the PFAS chemicals that we're hearing so much about right now. Those were, you know, already in use for 30 or 40 years at that time. And so the, we have 62,000 chemicals that 
never had any analysis and there was no requirement that up until 2016 when we had a policy change took 40 years for that law to get updated. So if we want to talk about the disconnect between what's actually happening in commerce in the marketplace with the evolution of new products and new molecules um, and the policy that's quote protecting us, the law didn't get updated for 40 years. The law governing cosmetics was last updated in 1938. Like mm -hmm. we are not being protected by our federal policies. And so we have, you know, all of these untested chemicals in the marketplace. And up until very recently, there was no requirement that chemicals be tested prior to going to market. So in the United States, we take an innocent until proven guilty. The onus is on the consumer to prove guilt, not on the manufacturer to prove safety. And so that's why we get into these situations where we're finding out after the fact, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, that like, oh, shit, DDT was probably a bad idea. Shit, diethylstilbestrol was probably a bad idea because there was nobody overseeing whether or not um, these chemicals had any uh, harm. And then obviously science evolves where, we, where we're at in our understanding of the human body and the things that can affect us now are so different from where they are then. And so the science keeps evolving, but our policies do not. And so the federal government um, is really not protecting the American population and the environment as a whole in their policies. And I think what happens is the consumers have this presumption that everything for is uh, that's on sale in the stores has been vetted and is safe and um, you know it's just not the case. So we have that situation um, just as to sort of set up like how is it that we're not being protected because our policies are just grossly outdated. Yeah. So then we have this situation where you know since. 1976, uh, we've added more chemicals to the inventory. Um, it, and so the number that's touted is that there's about 84,000 chemicals in use. Globally, it's closer to 100 or 150,000. Um, amazingly, only recently, as in like last year, did the EPA actually say, you know what, um, we should probably find out how many of these 84,000 are actually being used because we don't even know. Mm. And so they did that analysis. There's approximately 40,000 chemicals that are actively in use right now in the United States. There's probably more, but that's sort of a rough number. And, um, you know, uh, a number of decades ago, the CDC, CDC started doing human biomonitoring studies to kind of see like, okay, what is in the human population? What are we being exposed to? And that data doesn't tell us any health effects. It doesn't make any presumptions of what's happening. It's just saying, look, here's what the data says. And there are hundreds and hundreds of chemicals, approximately 300 uh, uh, so far that have been measured by the CDC inside humans. So 98% of us have bisphenol, metabolites of bisphenols in our urine. We have um, you know, uh, flame retardants and heavy metals and all of these industrial chemicals um, uh, Babies that are in utero are exposed to hundreds of industrial chemicals, jet fuels, rocket fuels. Um, and that's not to say that just because a chemical is present, it's bad, right? We don't want to just tar everything with the same brush. This is where a lot of people in the devil's, devil's advocate conversation are like, well, everything is a chemical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. I, I was getting ready to say that. Yeah, I'm like, I, I'm like, I've heard him before, so I know what's coming, <laughs> yeah. right? So everything is a chemical, and this is where the, this is my favorite, um, dihydrogen monoxide, yeah. you better be careful of it, like that's water, okay? And I'm always like, come at me, bro. Yeah, yeah you see the, these memes of people who are like, dihydrogen monoxide can... Uh, you know, do can do this. It can kill you if you consume. It's the most. It's a universal solvent. Like, oh, right. it's so toxic. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so they water. they they list off all these scary things, and then they're like, it's actually just H two O. It's just plain water. Yes. So everything can sound scary if you make it, yes. and like everything's a chemical, right? And yes. so, like, but these are the kinds of false equivalences. Yes. That that we need to to point out because yeah, and in, there is a in, difference between a substance that is proven beneficial yes. to human health uh and there's and and also substances which um are benign substances like water which are actually necessary vital yeah. nutrients for human yeah. health 
versus substances that have no such links with human health. There's no proven benefits. They're not a necessary nutrient for life. Yep. Um, we know, and, and the only studies that exist on those chemicals with human health show harm, if anything. Yeah. Well, and then unless you're looking at the industry funded studies, in which case they show um, no associations. Um, I find this fascinating. I'll just interject here about the new book by Robert um, Bilot, who is uh, the lawyer that spent 20 years suing DuPont over the PFAS contamination in Parkersburg, Parkersburg, West Virginia. He has a new book out called Exposure that's excellent. And uh, Mark Ruffalo is going to be in a uh, feature length film this fall coming out about that story, which is going to be amazing. But um, DuPont's line for decades was that we have seen no evidence of harm. It's because there were no studies. Mm -hmm. There were very, the, and the only studies that existed were their own internal studies, and those all showed harm. So yeah. they just, just because you can't see it, just because it's not published in the literature, doesn't mean it's safe. So absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Yeah. And so we have to be really careful about how we're talking about um, toxins and chemicals and we're not, we don't mean all chemicals. So in the field of environmental health or environmental medicine, they're specifically looking at the chemicals that we know to cause harm. And so when we get all of the, you know, the naysayers who don't understand what we're talking about and um, they don't understand the nuance there, uh, which is which is frustrating. Mm -hmm. So these chemicals are in us. Not all of them are bad. S chemicals have for sure made our lives better, easier, safer, um, and some of that has come at a cost. Uh, the num basically environmental. Every single chronic illness that people are dealing with has some association with an environmental exposure, whether it's an adult exposure, in utero exposure, um, early childhood exposure. We can see the data that is lining up, doesn't matter what the chronic illness is or what the health issue is. It could be everything from gut dysbiosis to acne, to Alzheimer's, to dementia, to autism, to um, infertility, leaky gut, insomnia, brain fog, neurological issues, like you name it. There are associations in the literature um, uh, to these exposures to particularly chronic exposures. So we'll go back to this idea that our chemicals have been tested for safety. Well, that's where we're looking at traditional toxicology, which does not test for chronic low dose exposures. And to uh, traditional toxicology is also not testing for the endpoints that we would consider to be a harmful um, effect, like a slight thyroid suppression, and that a th slight thyroid suppression during pregnancy might increase risk of autism. So they're not looking at those kinds of outcomes. They're looking at organ weight and cancer and death mm -hmm. um, to determine toxicity. And so we have to be willing to, to suspend our un understanding of what we consider something to be toxic um, and really kind of stretch that definition because we're not talking about acute toxicity in most cases. We're not talk People say, oh, if this stuff was so toxic, why aren't people pouring into emergency rooms? It's, it's, I've heard that so many times. From like the BPA and plastic Yes, like, oh, bottles. the plastic yeah. bottles, like it's yeah. not that toxic. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, frankly, that to me just shows a, a lack of understanding of science and what the research suggests and that somebody just hasn't, hasn't done their due diligence to actually investigate what the literature says. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, this is a nice segue into th this concept of non-monotonic dose responses. Yes. So the, there, there's one of the common arguments from people who are saying uh, these toxins are not of a concern. They're in such small amounts yep. that they're just, you know, not relevant doses. They're not near the threshold of what's going to cause some observable sort of acute poisoning effect. Yeah. Therefore, they, they must be insignificant. What are the limitations of that reasoning? Uh, so I like to say that that concept of the dose makes the poison, which is really depicted in a monotonic linear dose response curve. Uh, in a, and and know, just, just explain monotonic. Yeah, I know so monotonic, is first, a, it's, you, it's a straight line. So if we're looking at like a graph and we got, you know, I'm like, how do I do this? A straight line that goes either like this or like this. So it's either a positive or a negative association. Um, and the key here is that the response is predictable. It goes in one direction and that direction doesn't change. And um, this is... Uh, this monotonic or linear dose response curve is basically um, 
a visual depiction of the dose makes the poison, which was coined by Paracelsus in like the 1500s. So, hey, I don't know, maybe let's evolve our science. Just throw on that out there. Um, so, uh, you know, it is a true but partial statement. So it is true. It is just not absolutely true. Uh, I think it was the journal Nature that published a, a whole article about this uh, dialogue between toxicology and endocrinology and monotonic and non-monotonic dose response curves. And they talked about, um, they used the word dogma, foundational dogma that that is the approach that toxicology has around this, mo everything is the dose makes the poison, everything follows that. And it's, it's predominantly true, so like radiation, the small amount of radiation we get from eating a, a banana is not harmful, but the amount of radiation that we might get from say Chernobyl will kill us. Like that is a, a substance or an exposure that has a very linear dose response curve. And, you know, in traditional toxicology, they're looking at, you know, uh, exposures that are thousands of times above and beyond what the average individual is going to get. And then they're extrapolating downwards and they're looking for this, this what, what's called the low L, the lowest observed adverse effect level. So the lowest point when they see something harmful, and then they go a little bit lower and they go, okay, here's the point where we don't see anything. That's the no L. And then they build in a couple of factors of sa so those little buffer safety factors. And then they actually stop doing the research and they just assume, assume, which I find fascinating. And there was actually um, a, a toxicology textbook by Hayes actually put forth that that theory has literally never been tested. It is an assumption in science that has not been tested. Mm -hmm. So for in the entire field of toxicology to rest on that, without it having been tested, kind of blew, blew my mind when I read that. And so what's happening is that when we get to these really low levels of exposures, levels that are below, and this is actually how the NIH, partly how the NIH defines low dose, because that's a term that's, it's not a real number, it's just a range. And, um, you know, they define low dose as something that's not, uh, that does not fall within the realm of traditional toxicology. So like if they're not looking at it, maybe that's low dose. Low dose is also the range in which humans are being exposed. Mm -hmm. That's considered low dose. So what we're being, the, the parts per million and billion and trillion that we're being um, exposed to these chemicals, that is considered low dose. And when we're looking at a specific subset of environmental chemicals, um, uh, specifically endocrine disrupting chemicals, they kind of blow this whole concept of the dose makes the poison out of the water. Um, and so what happens, and it was fascinating because toxicology, traditional toxicology still kind of refutes this concept. They're like, it's not real. It's just make-believe. There's no data su to support it. Yet the entire field of pharmacology and endocrinology operate on this as being fact because every pharmaceutical drug we've ever developed is delivered in the body in parts per billion and parts per trillion doses because that is the low dose level that um, uh, our our body responds to. And as we know, there's tremendous side effect uh, side effects, negative side effects with a lot of the pharmaceuticals that we're getting. And just just, yeah. just clarify that for a second. So let's say you take um you know a hundred milligram dose of a particular pharmaceutical drug. You're you're saying that amount of milligrams is going to be parts per million or parts on, yeah it depends on because it's not a um it's per kilogram per uh it's milligram per kilogram of body weight okay. so it's not an apples to apples you have to actually do a, a conversion to get it to a parts per million so like when uh, it's in the human body yes it's okay. it's done a little bit differently but you know we look at at you know the doses of for example like birth control the amount of uh, estradiol or synthetic estradiols that are in there are so tiny because duh that's the levels that our body is designed to respond to that's why they work mm -hmm. even and they have a, a giant range of side effects you had dr jolene brighton on your podcast recently so you know i'm sure she talked about some of those side effects yeah and so that's a biologically active compound that's being delivered into the body in these minute levels that toxicology consider wouldn't consider an issue because 
it rel runs into the realm of pharmacology. So toxicology and pharmacology are sister disciplines. They're just on different ends of the spectrum. So pharmacology is the useful and beneficial. Toxicology is when the substances are no longer useful and beneficial and they're toxic. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that endocrine disrupting chemicals um, often display these what are called non-monotonic dose response curves, which can look like a U, a U or an inverted U, or they can be a wavy line. And the reality is they are unpredictable. So if we're thinking about traditional toxicology and that pass, uh, uh, path from the maximum tolerated dose all the way down to the low L and then the no L, and then they put in that little buffer and then they stop, it's that everything that's happening in those really low doses that they are just assuming follows that same path. But with endocrine disruption, we're finding that there's all kinds of activity in there. So um, in, in other words, to, to simplify all that and, and distill it into like a, something very practical, a very low dose of something is not necessarily safe. A very low yes. dose can still be biologically active. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we've seen this with, um, it's, it's what, what blows my mind is that this is well established in the literature in some parts. So if you look at the breast cancer drug, drug tamoxifen, it actually shows a non-monotonic dose response curve, like it's well established. And so that what we have is in the beginning when you're giving somebody tamoxifen, nothing happens, then they actually get a flare where their symptoms get worse and the cells start to, the cancer cells proliferate. And then it comes down and that's where tamoxifen really has that sweet spot. So people who breast cancer um, patients who are taking tamoxifen experience this really painful flare. So that's just showing it's going up and then it's going down. And so this is what's happening with endocrine disrupting chemicals at these really tiny doses. So um, the hormones in our bodies uh, are measured typically in parts per trillion. This is really, really tiny. I like to say that our hormones are communication messengers and they communicate in whispers really quietly. Mm -hmm. And so when we're being exposed to parts per trillion and parts per million and parts per billion of chemicals, mm -hmm. it's at a frequency that our body responds to. And that's more concerning than really high dose for those types of chemicals. Okay. So there's, there's two other layers to this story that I think are from my understanding, and I'm certainly much less of an expert on this topic than you are, um, but there's two other layers of this kind of safety research that I, I think are relevant. You tell me if my thinking is on the right track. One is uh, this example you gave of tamoxifen just now, the fact that we know this non-monotonic response and we yep. kind of, we've done the safety research. Yeah. Um, th my understanding is that like the fact that we've done it with that particular chemical we is great but we actually haven't done that kind of not you know actual detailed yep. study of the actual true effects of very low dose effects of a substance for most of these tens of thousands of chemicals yeah. that you're referring to so that's one layer is we don't actually know we're we're as you said before just basing it off of the um the low L and no L measurements and then extrapolating down to what yep. we think would probably be the effect of lower doses of that substance. And then the other thing that I think is a big factor, especially as we talk about uh, pesticide residues in conventional organic, which I want to get into, um, we, it, when you look at those studies and the conclusions people are drawing about the, these pesticide residues in health, one of the consistent concerns that these toxicology researchers are bringing up is we have no idea what any potential synergism is between yes. low doses of multiple, of dozens yes. of these different chemicals are. And we have some real indication that there may be synergism. We've, we've got examples of synergism of, of chemicals in other places. And there's no real studies of the synergism of these chemicals. So we, all the, the safety studies that do exist, they're not taking, for the most part, they're not taking into account these non-monotonic dose responses. Yep. And they're not taking into a, they're doing these safety studies in isolation on yeah. each individual chemical for the most and they're part. They're short studies. They're three yeah. month studies. They're not doing chronic low dose exposure studies that those don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, they just don't. And so, you know, there's certainly when it comes to endocrine disruption, there have been some studies that are starting to tease apart this like cocktail effect mm -hmm. of 
you know, what happens when we have two endocrine disrupting chemicals or three and the effect compounds. So it's not one plus one equals two. It might be one plus one equals five. Mm -hmm. And, and that's again in, in isolation. And that's how these, all of our research is done is in isolation. And beyond that, we're looking at epidemiology, which a lot of people in the evidence-based space are like, epidemiology is mm. not, it's junk, but it's what we have. Yeah. And, you know, it's not ethical to test chemicals on humans. Right. So this is what we have. And that data um, tells us things that we should be paying more attention to and not being so dismissive of. Yeah. Th th this is an important juncture. I, th I want to emphasize this, this point, which is what, if you figure in these layers of the story that you just explained and, and that I added with the fact that these chemicals are studied in isolation, the, the non-monotonic issue, the reality is with a lot of these chemicals, we don't have any real relevant research yeah. as far as these, the long-term effects of low dose exposures that are chronic for years or decades. Yep. We, we don't know, we don't have a randomized con controlled trial um, that lasts for 40 years or even five years of yep. people consuming, you know, people who are administered doses of dozens of different know, chemicals or even, or even yep. one of these chemicals yeah. uh, and versus a group that uh, that that did that wasn't given that a placebo control control group. And the reality of, is, if you talk to any of the companies that do like urine testing for these types of toxins, there's no control. Yes, we have no control because meaning there's no unexposed control population. Mm -hmm. We are all exposed. Yes. So, so there's yeah. so my point is that there's limit there's real limitations in the yeah. research in a perfect world we we just do a placebo controlled study of the substance versus no substance we've got a very clear randomized controlled study that we can know the effect and but if we can't do that as is the case with these chemicals um we we have to rely as you said on epidemiological research yep. which is not ideal but it's the best we got so yeah. the what the juncture that you're at is you can either like either way you have to make some kind of speculative leap from yep. this point you either have to assume that all of these chemicals are perfectly benign and that these low doses can't possibly have an effect yep. or you have to assume that especially since we know the the effect of these chemicals in larger doses that actually has been studied and shows clear negative effects you can assume it maybe is more likely that they do have negative effects. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's the, you know, it's erring on the side of caution because yeah. the reality is that we are all, we're all living in a, an age where we have the highest rates of chronic disease, the highest expenditure of healthcare, and we can't afford to not look at this. So there was a really fascinating study published in 2016 um, uh, that was headed by Dr. Leo Trasandi from the um, NYU Langone Medical Center. Um, and he, they looked at in this study, 5% of the known endocrine disrupting chemicals, of which there's over a thousand that have been identified using very limited criteria by the um, federal government. So there's probably a lot more. So they looked at 5% of the known endocrine disrupting chemicals and compared them to, I think it was around 11 chronic diseases or chronic health issues like cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and also um, loss of IQ. And what they found was, uh, and they extrapolated out the financial burden of having those illnesses. And they found that this 5% of endocrine disrupting chemicals contributed, contributed $340 billion annually in healthcare costs and lost wages. Mm -hmm. And that's 2% of our gross domestic product. And that is a tiny sliver. So, you know, like, the, and in the European Union where they regulate chemicals differently, it was about a third less of a burden because the federal the in the european union the european union countries have national health care we can argue about whether or not it's good or not that's not the point but the point is that the government foots the bill for that health care expenditure and in the u.s because we don't have any federal mandated health care system we foot the bill mm -hmm. and the federal government is under no pressure to regulate chemicals differently because they don't they don't have to pay for it we have to pay for it in 
healthcare costs. So I think it's, it's, um, it's a dangerous assumption to make that these chemicals, these very low doses are safe. So here's a good example. Um, the um, uh, FDA has set a 50 micrograms per kilogram of body weight um, of bisphenol A as being safe per day. So they're like, that's the level that's safe. So two years ago, research team said, okay, we're going to test that. And we are actually going to administer bisphenol A to humans because this oh. is the level that the government says is safe. Like oh. these studies so it, are it rare. Be, it becomes ethical to do it. To yes. do the kind of study if and the, government and the chemical com the chemical industry actually questioned the ethics of that study, which uh. is like, oh, come on guys. Yeah. What are you so worried about if your product is safe? <laughs> and so what they found was that I believe it was, it might be misspeaking, but I believe it was after one day of having this exposure, um, they had increased um, uh, insulin resistance. Mm. Wow. One day from an exposure that's quote safe. Right. And so, you know, and there's been other studies that have found that um, these are my studies, but that um, BPA at like a thousand fold less than what the EPA considers is safe. Um, alters leptin and ghrelin levels in the body. So like there's all of these endpoints that are just not being explored. So we have very incomplete data about what is safe and what is not safe. And we, if we look back historically at the track record of chemical use and what we're learning, all the messes that we're cleaning up after the fact, this we're, there's a, a consistent enough pattern for me to proceed very cautiously yeah. <laughs> going forward. Right. It's, yeah, I mean, it's it's basically like what makes more sense to proceed with some caution in case these chemical yeah. exposures, uh, even at low doses. I mean, again, we know they're they're toxic and harmful in high doses. It's undebatable. Yes. Um, yeah. But even in low doses, should we assume that there's a potential for harm, or should we assume they're perfectly safe? And like, I mean, one of those two things just makes vastly more sense to me than the other one. Um, I think that if we were living in a time where people were predominantly very healthy, mm -hmm. I might take a different opinion, yeah, but we're I not, think. we're yeah. not, we're living in an age when people are predominantly sick yeah. and the rates of disease are increasing faster than can be ex explained by genetics. When we have cancer that, you know, 90% of cancer is attributed to the environment and not term environment means things like exercise and smoking and not just environmental chemicals, but like many of the chronic illnesses that we are experiencing right now are preventable. And that's what the research says. Yeah. They're preventable. So, you know, we have to move towards the direction of limiting when, an, when a option exists in the marketplace, let's choose that. And the great thing is the landscape of, con of, uh, consumer products in the marketplace has shifted dramatically in the last decade. So there are so many more options. It's yeah. absurd to not, not choose safer. Yes. Um, I want to mention one quick thing uh, as you're talking about the, the BPA study. Yeah. Um, I was, as I was prepping today for this podcast, I was going through a bunch of research around um, pesticides and, and endocrine disrupting chemicals and, and yeah. things like that. Uh, and I was listening to, there's a, on YouTube, there's a really nice, um, it's like an hour long lecture from Harvard uh, Medical School, the, the Harvard YouTube channel. And they have a panel of their Harvard experts all talking about specifically pesticides and health. And one of the guys, one of these experts on the panel mentioned, um, he brought up the example of lead. And historically, lead was thought you know, kind of these, these, uh, these low L and no L measurements. And they, they basically thought, oh, you know, as soon as we get below the, this amount of lead, then it's, it's not going to be harmful anymore. Yeah. And so they kept studying lower and lower and lower doses of this lead. And they kept finding evidence of harm, even yeah. at way lower doses than they were speculating that they would find. And eventually they just realized that there's lead no has level. has known toxic effects at like even tiny tiny doses and then the guy said uh specifically after that he concluded uh, or he he said speculatively i believe that we will find the same thing is true for pesticide exposures absolutely 
So and I think uh, it depends. Certainly not all pesticides are the same. Yes. Some pesticides are extremely persistent. Those are the ones that I think are extremely concerning because some of those, you know, have half lives of 10, 20 years. 30 years, and we are building them up in our tissues faster than where bodies are able to break them down. That's really concerning. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I, I, I think that that's probably what we're going to find is that as the research continues in this space, we're going to go, you know what, we got it wrong. Like we, we, we didn't really understand how bad these are. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, let, let's dig into pesticides and conventional yeah. organic right now. There's there's a bunch of topics we could cover. We're not going to have time to cover everything, but I want to dig into conventional versus organic. I want to dig into water, maybe personal care products. Yeah. Um, if it. we have time, another topic or two. Do you have a hard cutoff at no. five? Okay. Nope. So I think we're going to go a little over. Good. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, conventional versus organic uh, there was a friend and colleague of mine who put out some information on this topic recently that I really strongly disagreed with. I think even the, the panel of Harvard experts I was just referring to strongly disagree with the conclusions. Um, but some of the arguments that are being put forth by uh, kind of skeptics, uh, evident, these, the, these evidence-based skeptics that I was referring to previously, are things like, oh, you know, there's chemicals everywhere. Even organic has chemicals too. Uh, and which is which is true. True, absolutely. Um, and uh, and you know, since they both use chemicals, one isn't superior to the other. And then they might selectively cite, you know, an example of like one pesticide that's that's used within organic agriculture. That's like, and they'll say, oh, this one is even super toxic, and and therefore organic is just as bad. And um, I, I I'm just curious. So, what's your take on this landscape of conventional versus organic? And do pesticides? Well, I guess let me also add one layer to the story, which is to to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, there are people who argue the amounts of these pesticide residues on produce, even conventional produce, yep. is so small it's barely detectable. It's in you know, as you said earlier, like parts per trillion. It's you know, you, they'll, they'll say things like, uh, these amounts of pesticides are insignificant. They're so small, such that you'd have to consume 100 pounds of celery in a day to reach yeah. any significant toxicity yes. from, the, uh, uh, from, from the pesticide residues. Um, and at that point, you know, the chemicals, for example, the oxalates in the spinach will be more toxic right. than the pesticide residues. Right. So what... What is the problem, if you think there's a problem, what's the problem with that line of reasoning? Well, I mean, I think we just talked about this idea that low doses matter, first of all. And, you know, when we're talking parts per trillion, this is not a pesticide, but this will connect. Um, the, the level of PFAS chemicals that is uh, considered safe is, uh, in drinking water is 70 parts per trillion. And a lot of health bodies are like, whoa, that's way too high to up disease risk. So that's in a parts per trillion. So I think that the reality is that the, the weight of evidence of the data is all pointing to these very minuscule amounts of pesticides, residues that are on the final product that we take back from the grocery store and into our homes. That is our primary exposure source. That's what the EPA says. That's what the NIH and the CDC says, that our primary source of exposure to organophosphate pesticides, which is the primary class of pesticides that are used, there's certainly other classes, comes from our produce. And then we have studies that are saying, okay, if we're looking at um, uh, uh, the, the levels of exposure that we are being exposed to, to these pesticides and then correlating with them to all of these different diseases, I think you can't make that statement that those low levels don't matter. Mm. And it, it also reinforces this whole um, cocktail effect conversation. We're not just eating one vegetable, hopefully. We're eating a lot of vegetables and lots of fruits. And these are also not the only sources of pesticides and herbicide exposure that we're getting is certainly not through our fruits and vegetables. That's certainly a primary place but you know when we're looking for example at like the environmental working groups dirty dozen clean 15 
um, they're only looking at fruit and fruits and vegetables because that's what the U.S. Um, EPA market basket or FDA market basket uh, data is based on, just fruits and vegetables. So I don't think the data supports that um, we can find data that supports that the low levels of pesticides are not at all harmful. But I think that the weight of evidence is showing the opposite. I think we also have to consider, although this is certainly not a primary reasoning why somebody would choose organic, but there have been numerous studies that show that organic foods have higher levels of vitamins and antioxidants because they have their own natural pesticides in the form of antioxidants that are what we are seeking when we go eat a colorful red pepper or a deep green kale. Like we're looking for these nutrients and the higher nutrient compounds come, um, they are the plant's natural defensive mechan mechanism. And when we rely on pesticides that um, they no, plants no longer produce those higher levels of natural pesticides. So there's that. Um, I think- well, Actually, let, let's dig into that. Cause yeah, okay. there, there's some more that needs to be built out there. First of all, uh, most people don't realize that a lot of these phytochemicals that are in plants that are associated with health benefits are, as you said- Natural uh, pesticides. Natural pesticides, insecticides that the plant produces. Um, now, that fact, um, it, first of all, it's very interesting. There's a whole area called xenohormesis uh, in the literature that's fascinating, um, one of my areas of, of passion. But this fact has also been used by some of these evidence-based skeptics uh, as they've, they've yes. reframed this as though it were a bad thing. Yeah. So they've basically said, see, the organic ones have higher levels of these phytotoxins too, these natural insecticides. And then they draw this false equivalence between right. these natural phytotoxins and synthetic pesticides. And saying basically saying, oh well, you know, if you eat organic, you're getting higher levels of internally produced, you know, by the plant um, uh, pesticides, and therefore, either way, you're getting pesticides. What they leave out of this story is that those phytotoxins are decidedly associated with health benefits in yes. humans, as opposed to the synthetic pesticides, which have yes. no such benefits. Absolutely, and I think a really key piece of information here when we're trying to say like, oh, organic also uses pesticides. Yes, they do. They're using, um, uh, they're not allowed to use, uh, primarily not allowed to use synthetic pesticides and, and the amount of pesticides, meaning the, the different types of pesticides is far more restricted than the thousands of pesticide products that are on the market for conventional produce. Um, I think, uh, you know, where for example, the EWG's Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 gets it wrong is that they're only looking at the amount of the residue, not the relative toxicity of the pesticide. And so there's a new analysis uh, Dr. Lynn Patrick has been doing um, this past year that's really kind of blowing that whole concept apart. And what's she's found, what she found based on the like what's in the EPA published literature is that there is a 6,000 fold difference in toxicity in organophosphate and organochlorine pesticides. Organochlorines are most, mostly phased out, but um, there is a 6,000 fold difference in toxicity. So you might have a really tiny amount of a pesticide on the clean, uh, uh, food on the clean 15 list that is 6,000 times more toxic than the equal amount on the dirty dozen. So it's not just the amount of pesticide, it's the relative toxicity of those pesticides. And the only way to systematically reduce our exposures is to move towards organic. Like that's it. Like there is no cheat sheet unless you wanna get into like major, majorly in the weeds with malthionon versus chlorpyrifos versus whatever. And nobody wants to do that except Lynn Patrick, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more nuance to this that I think needs to be uh, understood by people, which is, there, there are people who make this argument that, you know, conventional organic both use pesticides and then again, try to draw this false equivalence. Therefore, they're both equally toxic. You just pointed out one of the big flaws in that. But the other thing is it doesn't matter really what is used on the farm. Yes. What is, what is, I mean, 
it does for the environment, which is a yes. whole other discussion. And there's a whole big discussion to be had around what's happening in the environment as a result of these chemicals. Too broad of a scope for this discussion. We'll just talk about human health. But in the context of human health, um, we, we, we also know that um, when it doesn't matter what's used on the farm, it matters the residues that end up on the produce and yeah. the weight of the evidence that actually measures that and that measures also levels of pesticides in the human body. While it's not perfect and you can always point out, oh, well, they didn't measure this or that pesticide, so we don't really know. It needs to be more comprehensive. The weight of all of that evidence is very consistently in the direction of organic produce having lower amounts of pesticide residues, yep. a much higher percentage where there's no pe detectable pesticide residues at all. Um, and the pesticide residues that are detected are of lower toxico toxicological concern. Yes. So, it, I mean, it's just very clear, given what we, you know, all the caveats of the research what, that we don't know, we don't have great long-term studies on the, the risk of multiple exposures of dozens of exposures long-term in low doses. Um, it is clear that moving towards organic does lower your body load of pesticides overall and lower, especially the ones of greater toxicolog toxicological concern. Yeah. And I think the other audience that we're completely leaving out of this is, you know, pregnant women or, you know, babies in utero that are extraordinarily sensitive to these minute levels of substances that can affect their neurodevelopment or their sexual differentiation, um, you know, and, and they are the most sensitive audience. We know that they're being exposed in utero because we have these umbilical cord studies. There's not a lot of them, but they are showing that these chemicals, you know, compounds, pesticides, jet fuels, heavy metals, nonstick chemicals, et cetera, are showing up in minute amounts and we're seeing that you know what are we also seeing in our population is this massive increase in neurological issues um developmental issues in children attention issues uh and you know even things like gender dysmorphia um you know we have to start questioning what is the role of these chemicals in this massive uptick in these types of outcomes that we're seeing and you know it's such a sensitive population i know that there's been some studies of um agricultural workers which is like a whole nother reason right like if we are consuming conventional food we are supporting the poisoning of of human beings who are working the fields and those human beings go home and they have pesticide residues on their clothes and they are having, um, there is a, it's called para-occupational exposures. Their family members are now being exposed to much higher levels. There was a study done in uh, the Valley, in uh, Salinas Valley in California, um, looking at the families of, of um, agricultural workers and their children and neuro, neurodevelopmental um, status. And they, you know, paired children in the Valley who are um, you know, in the area where all this agriculture is and the ones outside of the valley in the mountain range that don't have pesticides. And they just said, draw stick figure. Mm. And, the, and you see the side by side comparison of these images. It's heartbreaking because the kids are the exact same age and the kids in the valleys can't draw stick figure mm -hmm. and the kids outside can. So like, I, I, I cannot see any reason to defend the use of pesticides, even if all of the data said there's no individual human health from consuming these foods. We also have to think of the broader implication of who else is being exposed. And we have thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of agricultural workers that are occupationally exposed to these chemicals um, and have increased rates of all different types of prostate cancer and lung cancer and skin cancers. Um, and do we ignore them? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, one of the other arguments that I, that I want to bring to the table that you sometimes hear is uh, if these pesticides and all these chemicals that are sprayed on produce uh, are so harmful, why is it that we can see that people who consume more produce, even if it's conventional produce, uh, are, show health benefits versus people who consume less produce? And, um, you know, we had some discussions outside of this on this subject. I also uh, just sent you a brand new study that yes. just came out like in the last few days yep. um, 
that gives us some fodder for discussion here. But um, what, if these chemicals are harmful, why would it be? How would it be possible that you could see uh, health benefits from consuming more produce? Because vegetables are good for us, and most people <laughs> don't eat vegetables. Like I think that's the reality: is that we have, you know, of course these foods also provide. Um, nutrition, nutrients that our bodies need. Absolutely. So I never want people to feel like they're in a position, first of all, between like eating organic or eating no vegetables. Mm -hmm. I think, and a lot of critics of the environmental working group say that they're fear mongering and now people are afraid to eat vegetables. That's definitely not the intention. We want people to eat vegetables and there is also within that population, very likely higher risks of other types of illnesses. So maybe overall they have improved health and you know decreases of disease. We have to look at the subsets of, you know, how's their thyroid function, how's their hormone function, because that might not be classified as a disease, but if they have low level um, hormone dysregulation or gut dysbiosis because they're being exposed to glyphosate, which acts as an antibiotic in the GI system, um, you know, we, we have, um, we have to take all of those things into consideration for sure. Um, and then I know that, you know, you had a really great point that you had made um, when we were going back and forth on this topic uh, about we have to, we have to comp we have to have enough comparison groups to actually make that data meaningful mm -hmm. because we can always take two points and kind of argue like, well, one is better, therefore the other one is bad. But we have to put it in relation to what? Yes. So yeah. then let's add a third group in that says, okay, great. Now let's see if we can say, what are the studies of people who eat more fruits and vegetables that are organic and compare how um, their health markers versus the ones that are eating a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables that are not? Yeah. And it's it's very interesting concept of like, can you have a negative within something that is a kind of a yes. net? a net positive. Can you still yeah. have some aspect that's negative? And there's a couple of examples that I thought of. One was like, if you compared a group of people that were sleeping eight hours a night um, to a group that was sleeping four hours a night, the group who's sleeping eight hours a night, even if they like had they were sleeping with the TV and all these artificial lights yeah. blaring into their eyes before yeah. bed, the group who's sleeping eight hours every night is going to have health benefits compared if you're comparing them to sleeping four hours. But that doesn't mean that what they're doing is perfect. If you were to compare them to a third group that's sleeping the same amount of hours but doesn't have artificial light blaring into their, their eyes at night suppressing melatonin, then you would see that that group is actually even more superior. Um, and therefore that the artificial light is associated with harm. And uh, another example is like if you compared a group that does no exercise to a group that exercises but has terrible forms such that you know they're going to get back injuries and yes. tendonitis and stress fractures and bulging discs in their in their back and all these different things the on the on the average across the whole population the group who's doing exercise is still going to have net health benefits yes. compared to the group doing no exercise but they're also going to have increased injuries uh, in all those different ways if you compare them to a third group that is doing all the exercise but was taught good form, they would perform even better. And then you'd realize you'd expose all of the problems of yeah. that second group of the people having bad technique and bad I form think it's doing just this a, exercise. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a, a weak and not fully thought out argument mm -hmm. to just pair. I mean, what do we need three points to make a line? Two points is, you know, we need, we need three to have a, an adequate comparison um, when we're trying to make comparisons like that. Um, so I think it's, you know, yes, of course, eating fruits and vegetables is good for us. And it would be better if they were organic. <laughs> yes. Um, do you want to speak to that study that that I just sent you? I'd, I'll just, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I just skimmed it, to be honest. But yeah, what I it, did too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, this is it's brand new. It's brand, brand new. And it's, it's um, and I'm just looking at it now. And I'm, I apologize, it's so dark in here because daylight savings changed and I don't have good lights in this room. So it's, um, it's basically speaking to the same principle. Exact principle, yeah. They actually did a study where they compared people consuming plenty of produce that's conventional versus plenty of produce that's organic. And yep. they found that the group consuming, so it was 145,000 uh, 145, women and over 24,000 men. They followed them for over a decade. And they found that eating 
Uh, organic produce correlated with a lower risk of heart disease while eating conventional produce did not, even yeah. after adjustment for healthy lifestyle factor. Yeah. So um, it's basically exactly the examples that, that I just gave of if you compare them, like if you just compare convention, eating conventional produce versus no produce, it's going to show that there's benefits to consuming produce, even if it's conventional. If you add in a third group where they're consuming the same amount of produce, but organic, that group will be superior. And that's, and I think it completely changes the takeaway Mm -hmm. when we exclude that third group, which Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do intentionally because it allows them to make the argument that they want to make without presenting the full, um, uh, full data or full, you know, analysis. Um, And we see that a lot for sure within different industries that are working really, really hard to defend the profits because, you know, we also live in an economy where, you know, they're legally required to produce profit if they're a publicly traded company. And so we're in this situation where, you know, we have giant multinational companies that are going to every length possible to defend the use of the product that they make. And they have everything to lose. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to take their their research and their rebuttals of these arguments with a grain of salt. And I think, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have the critical eye to see through some of the um, research that's coming out. Um, There was another, I don't remember where I saw this. It was a a paper somewhere that was basically saying that like, you know, the, the vast majority of, it wasn't a paper, it was a book. Don't remember which one. The vast majority of studies that are coming out of industry are showing benefit. Mm -hmm. Whereas the vast majority of studies coming out of independent science show harm. And this is not just to pesticides. It's to all of these different, you know, the PFAS chemicals and, um, and, and all of these, different right. types of toxicants that we're being exposed to. Yeah, interesting. Um, and well said. I, I think the grain of salt is very appropriate when you're looking at industry-funded studies. Um, one more thing I just want to say, lest we be accused of being food elitists here, um, I, I just want to mention there, there is a real economic concern for some people around this conventional versus organic issue. Uh, such that some people are in a financial position where it really makes a meaningful difference to them to, to have to buy organic or to, to buy organic versus conventional. And um, I just want to be clear, I think you agree with me that um, buying conventional produce is certainly better than no produce. 100%. And, and um, the net benefits over no produce are clear. Um, you should still buy even if you can't afford organic. And if you can't afford organic, just go conventional. That's, that's certainly a, a much better option than no produce. Yeah. And, and in, in situations like that, I really encourage people to make other changes around their home that maybe aren't costly or that many, many things are free, like open your windows, take your shoes off when you come in the door, um, stop buying scented candles and synthetic air fresheners. Like that will save you money. Like there are other things that we can do to reduce the overall body burden of environmental chemicals that we're exposed to. If we are in a financial situation where we can't spend more money on certain things. And and the other thing that I would add to that is, um, you know, we Costco is the largest retailer in the United States for organic foods. So if people are shopping at Costco, which I know a lot of families that, you know, struggle financially will go to a store like Costco because they can get a good deal. Go to Costco for your organic foods. Um, And then this is a shout out to everybody else who can afford these foods is this is what changes the landscape for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is like, you know, we vote with our dollars, um, you know, for all the ladies out there, our, our ladies are the primary spenders in society. We are the primary spenders of household. We have a tremendous power as consumers to, to create the kind of marketplace that we want. And I think we forget that because we become lazy consumers because, you know, the computer and the TV are telling us what to buy. And we're like, okay, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. Cause the TV told me to, I think that if we, we become informed on this topic um, and we double down for the people who can yeah. on organic food. We are investing in the types of 
industries and supporting the types of companies who are doing good work and that does affect everybody. Then we get to have larger organic farms that employ more farm workers that now don't have to be exposed to pesticides. So yep. there's lots of residual, um, I hate the expression trickle down, I think it's kind of ruined. Um, from the 80s, but <laughs> um, uh, you know there is a tremendous amount of trickle down um, to to uh, society as a whole, and so if we have the means, let's do it. And the fact that the demand has increased has uh, has has it caused an explosion of the organic Absolutely. market, um, and has driven prices down as demand has gone up, such that there isn't such a huge price gap in many cases anymore. Yeah. And, and personal care products, which I want to talk about a bit, maybe in brief yeah. form. Uh, also, the, there's been an explosion of healthy personal care oh, yeah. products that, that are free of a lot of the, the toxic crap. Yeah. So um, with that in mind, let's, let's actually cover the personal care stuff. Great. Personal care products. What is a concern here? Um, and, and are the, the chemicals here, maybe we'll start with something kind of basic that maybe not everybody understands are the things that we put on our skin relevant to yeah. human health? Like are, are these substances actually doing anything be, besides just sitting on our skin? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for, first of all, there's a, a, I've seen this uh, being sort of splashed around Facebook and the internet for years is this meme that's like, oh, everything you put on your skin enters your body in 26 seconds. Um, and it's usually somebody who's trying to sell you a non-toxic skincare product. And that is a statement that's patently not true. Um, so we have to, again, be mindful of our words and make sure that we're being accurate in um, what we're saying so that we're not feeding the naysayers who are like, oh, I'm going to take that and, and, and run with it. So um, our skin is a barrier. Um, it does obviously keep out many of the things that we put on it, but a lot of the chemicals that are used in the personal care products that we use do absorb into the skin, and some of them do absorb quickly, but there's no universal time frame. Um, there's lots of factors that determine whether or not something's capable of penetrating all the way into the bloodstream. Um, it has to do with molecule size, what's the, you know, um, how large or small is the molecule? What's the integrity of the skin like? Are you hydrated? Do you have a scratch? Like there's all of these different um, uh, factors. Does the product contain ingredients that are known penetration enhancers? And their job is to actually decrease the lipid barrier on your skin and increase penetration. Um, so there are chemicals whose job it is to actually push stuff into the skin. The reason why I think this is so concerning um, not certainly for all chemicals, but certain chemicals in this, uh, in this class of, of personal care products, is that when we absorb something through the skin and when we inhale something, these substances go right into the bloodstream. So they bypass what's called first pass metabolism. So when we eat something and it goes through our GI system and then it goes into the liver to be broken down or metabolized, and then that blood circulates through the back through the body. When we absorb something, it actually bypasses the benefit of getting broken down by the liver first. So it goes right into the bloodstream straight away and does its thing, and then will eventually make its way to the liver to be uh, metabolized if that's even possible. And you know, and so that's that is concerning to me is that we are absorbing chemicals that don't have the ability to be broken down. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we have that. Uh, uh, thing to consider when we're slathering body lotions and you know shampoos and shaving creams on um, most of the chemical uh, most of the personal care products that we're using can are made with synthetic uh, fragrances those fragrances contain a chemical called phthalates phthalates are a very well established endocrine disruptor so they you know very often have that non monotonic dose response they have um, health effects at extraordinarily low levels. Um, any time, I mean, what's the first thing somebody does when they go to the grocery store and tries a new product? They pop the top and they smell it because we are because we love fragrance, right? Fragrance is the largest or strongest trigger for memory. It's um, our olfactory receptor lives in the oldest, most primitive part of our brain. So, like, we love things that smell good, right? And so um, product manufacturers know this and they pump these synthetic fragrances into these products 
Uh, there's entire brands that are just nothing but the scent. Irish Spring, it's just the scent. Um, Herbal Essences Shampoo, it's just the smell. That's what they're selling you. They're not selling you on how good it cleans your skin or washes your hair. Herbal Essences, I don't even know if that stuff is for sale anymore because I don't really watch TV or TV <laughs> commercials. But like in the 80s and 90s, they was the lady with having the orgasm in the shower because her shampoo smelled so good. Um, and everybody remembers that. Because that's why I, I actually stocked up on that. Oh, you did? Oh, that's great. Okay. So you have that experience. Yeah, to keep my wife satisfied. Fair, fair. Yeah. Whatever it takes, man. That's right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, we are using dozens and dozens of these personal care products every single day. The Environmental Working Group, this was, I think, in 2000, maybe eight or nine, did a survey, uh, just a small survey of, you know, a couple hundred women um, and found that they use about an average of 12 personal care products. And there's approximately 168 chemicals that they're being exposed to every single day before leaving the bathroom. Certainly not all of those chemicals are harmful, um, but we do have some data on many of them, the parabens, the phthalates, uh, the pr other types of preservatives in there, um, uh, for products like sunscreens, which are a major was, issue. Yeah, I was gonna say, did you see the recent study that came out on sunscreens and, and like looking at blood, <laughs> blood absorption? I yeah, there, there was one that received a lot of publicity. I want to say yeah, it was a couple months ago, maybe six months, months ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So the UV filters, the benzofreenones and um, uh, octi, um, octin salate, octin oxate, and then there's a oxybenzone is the other one. Um, uh, these are all endocrine disruptors all endocrine disruptors, they're fairly well established and they are ubiquitous. So they're what's bleaching the coral reef and there are so many um, uh, associations in the literature linking these UV filters to chronic um, health issues and even birth defects. There's a birth defect called, I think it's called Hirschsprung's disease where um, part of the, in, a, in an infant, where part of the um, lower intestine doesn't form, it doesn't close properly. And so the child has like an open intestine um, and it has to be closed surgically. And there's a extremely strong association um, to specifically UV filters that cause that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to, again, it's this idea of like, if we have an option to choose better, which we do now, because this didn't exist 15 years ago, there was so few options. Um, then let's make that choice. 10 years ago, when I first started doing this research, I could count the number of clean brands on like my hands. Mm -hmm. And now I can't keep up because mm -hmm. there's so many, there's this huge surgence of um, consumers that want cleaner products and people that have started creating cleaner products in response to that. It's the fastest growing sector of the entire beauty industry is natural and organic. Mm -hmm. That said, there is a tremendous amount of greenwashing in this space because the terms natural and organic are not regulated by any federal agency as it pertains to skincare. So a lot well, of companies- even organic isn't. Yeah. So the only way that you can see a USDA organic seal on a personal care product is if they're using USDA certified food grade ingredients. Mm -hmm. So you can do that, but there's all kinds of companies that will use the, the word organic, um, natural. These things don't mean anything. And so a lot of consumers are duped into it, thinking just, that's just better. In, in, just specifically in the context of personal care as yes. opposed to food. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's no regulation for these terms. USDA is only regulating the USDA organic seal as it relates to food crops. Outside of food, they're like, it's not our purview. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there's even, I, I, there was a shampoo brand called Organics with an X at the end. Not organic, nothing organic <laughs> at all in the ingredients, but like they branded themselves that way. So a consumer yeah. who's maybe trying to do better for herself and her family is going to spend the extra $2 to buy this product that is perceived to be better, but in reality is not better at all. They're and like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We never said it was organic. We said Nix with an X. We said organics. It's like <laughs> cheese with a Z, right? So, um, except that with cheese with a Z, you actually have the FDA that is regulating that right. even poorly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think very much it's the Wild West when it comes to what's happening in personal care products. But, you know, there is a, there is a very large 
and growing body of safer and cleaner products that are not made with synthetic fragrances. They're not made with synthetic compounds. Um, you know, and then again, I'll just say play devil's advocate to myself is that not all synthetics are harmful. So there's a lot of people in the dermatological fields that are like, oh, everybody's freaking out about natural, but there are certain things like, you know, as much as I, I hate to say it, there's some um, types of petroleum byproducts in skin products that are so highly refined that there is actually no harm for them. Still don't like to use them, but you know, there, so we want to make sure that we're weighing both sides of all of these um, issues. But I think that, you know, we can simply swap out when we run out of shampoo, we can buy a safer product at this point, because the market is, um, you know, there's so much product availability, the cost, just like you were saying with organic, it's really not that different. It used to be that there was a big disparity. It used to be that organic skincare, natural skincare didn't work and it didn't do anything, but the game has completely changed mm -hmm. uh, for that. Yeah. Um, do you, on a very, very practical level, do you have any specific recommendations on what to watch out for? If you want to like name two or three things yeah, sure. that might be on an ingredient list to watch yeah. out for, or any specific brands that um, you'd recommend in the space of like women's personal care products yeah, or sure. something like that? So uh, I'll, give a, I'll give you one extra too. Oh, and so, sunscreen. Yes. Yeah. So um, as it pertains to personal care products, the number one ingredient that I want people to look for is the word fragrance. It's like a catch-all container word. Um, there can be up to 3,000 chemicals that make up the fragrance mixture. And then there's other chemicals like phthalates, which is not part of the fragrance mixture, but it stabilizes the fragrance so it sticks around. And it also helps that fragrance stick to your skin and your clothes so that, you know, you can go into the laundry get a laundry closet or a towel linen closet and find, you know, oh, my clothes still smell downy fresh two weeks after I wash them. So that's phthalates uh, that do that job. So um, even if the uh, product says it's phthalate free and it has the word fragrance, I still tell people to ditch it because there are a lot of synthetic musks that are used in the fragrance mixture that can be um, sensitizers, they can be allergens, some of them can even be endocrine disruptors, um, even without phthalates present. So if you see the word fragrance and it doesn't specify, you know, this type of essential oil and that type of plant-based essential oil, it's a no for me. Mm -hmm. So that's the first word to look for. Um, the second is I really encourage people to be mindful of parabens. Um, parabens are just a broad class of preservative, but they show up in our bodies. So most of us have, um, you know, some types of methylparaben, ethylparaben, propylparaben in our urine. Any word that ends in araben is a no. Um, um, then we have compounds like SLS. So if you see sodium lauryl sulfate or worse, sodium laureth sulfate. Um, these, uh, if it's sodium laurel sul sulfate, it can actually be a penetration enhancer and an irritant for the skin. Um, and then any, the sodium laureth sulfate. And that's, and that's sometimes in toothpaste as well. Yes, absolutely. It's in toothpaste. Um, and then of course we can add triclosan, which is still found in some types of personal care products. Triclosan. Wasn't that, that, that one was banned, right? No, it was only partially banned. So it was only banned from hand soaps and hand sanitizers mm. because the FDA um, tasked the companies using it to prove that it was actually better than soap and water and they couldn't do it. So the FDA said you can't use it then um, because it doesn't actually have any benefit and there is some data that suggests risk. So triclosan, yeah, triclosan is um, uh, a thyroid suppressant. Mm it's an endocrine disrupting chemical that um, goes after the thyroid. So uh, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, I'm like, what else? Any, any ingredient that ends in ETH. So like sodium laureth, satireth, it's a long list of chemicals that end in that, but that is an indication that the chemical or the ingredient has undergone a process called ethoxylation and ethoxylation produces um, a byproduct uh, that is carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. And companies can filter it out, but they don't ever bother.
because they don't care because they think a small amount is fine. So a little small amount of carcinogen is fine for you. Yeah. So don't like those ingredients. And then as for sunscreen, um, you basically want to throw everything out that is not zinc oxide. Easy and, enough. <laughs> yeah, easy enough. Like everything else is a no. Um, yeah. It's easier to have the yes list than a no list. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's lots of different brands. My, my favorite for women's um, skincare is Anne Marie Gianni. I think you got you know the Giannis. Yeah. Um, I use their stuff every single day. I love their skincare. Yeah, I I have to say my wife has tried several different um, high quality natural organic brands and. Um, and she raves about Anne Marie Gianni. Yeah, their their stuff is so hyper clean. They're like obsessive about the sourcing and the production, which even a lot of green companies are not. Um, people can also look for third party certifications. There's a great organization called Made Safe, which mm -hmm. and Anne Marie skincare stuff is certified Made Safe, um, and Made Safe will look at. They look beyond the ingredient label. So sometimes there's ingredients that companies don't have to disclose. And Made Safe basically hires an NDA, uh, uh, um, files an NDA uh, with every company that's like, I want to see everything, even, and then we'll decide whether or not we want to give you our certification. So they don't mince any words. And so if we can, you can, people can go to the Made Safe website and just look up products um, that are certified. And those are going to be ones that are like the best of the best. I try to to give people like this good, better, best option same thing with the organic conversation like best would be beating eating organic but better like it's still better than not eating organic to just eat vegetables yeah so good better best and so that exists in the skincare realm as well um i have a resource page on my website where i usually send people um where i curate i curate like here's the products that i personally like and use that i vetted um, but there's all kinds of um, online retailers like the Detox Market and Folane and Credo Beauty that really curate um, clean products for consumers for like a one-stop shop. So I just like mm -hmm. to set, like, none of these things existed even, you know, six, seven years ago. So it's really awesome to see the marketplace just exploding with options for people. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I want to mention a couple things. So one is we're way over time. I want to be respectful of your time. This has also been awesome. I, what I want to do is actually have you on a second time. Yeah, we'd love to. Uh, and there, I know that there's so much more knowledge and wisdom that you have to share, and we haven't even touched like water and, and water. Oh, water is one of my favorite ones. I could um, talk and, about that one forever. Yeah, or air pollution. And, yes. and there's a whole bunch of other topics we could we could touch on. So I know we have lots more content that we can address. I think there's more than adequate content for part two and part three. Even. Excellent. Um, so I would love to do that. This has been epic. The other thing I want to mention to everybody listening is uh, if you go to the energyblueprint.com forward slash, uh, we'll put it at, we'll put it at your name, Laura Adler. So L-A-R-A -A and then A-D-L-E-R. Um, that'll be the link to this episode. And we'll also have links to the specific studies that we've referenced, for example, on pesticides and, um, you know, the one we mentioned on, on, for example, like conventional versus organic and heart disease risk, uh, and some of the other studies, as well as some of the, the brand, recommended brands and products and things like that, that we're mentioning here. Um, and the third party site that I forget the name of it. Made safe. Yeah. yeah. So, um, We'll have all those links laid out for you guys. The energyblueprint.com forward slash Laura Adler, all one word. Uh, Laura, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for the extra time. We're almost half an hour over time. So thank you so much. I'm glad you didn't have an extra appointment by, no. uh, after that. So um, really, this has been such a pleasure. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. You're, thank you for sharing your wisdom with my audience. I really appreciate it. And I will reach out to you for part two. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.